Hello everyone, I am Bradley Swart, Associate Professor of Computer and Information Science at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And this video today is going to look at compound comparison statements for while and do while loops, binary shift and rotation operations as a homework example. That is a mouthful. So this is basically our homework activity example, something like that. So this is basically activity 11, 13, 12, somewhere in there, 11, 12, 13, depending on when you're taking this course. Um, so let's take a look at the problem. And the problem looks like this. Basically, it is a multiply function that multiplies without multiplying. It does bit shiftings and uh, basic additions to get the job done. And so uh, I, I gave this to you in C++ or C, C or C++, however you look at it. And basically, my first step would be to kind of go through this and massage this thing down to figure out how can I, you know, I made this pretty simple, and you know, simple is in relative terms when it comes to, you know, how to port this over into assembly language. But you do have to have that understanding that these are globals here, and these are locals, you know, when it, or you know, parameters when it comes to variables. So this x and this x and this y and this y are completely different variables when it comes down to it. When I modify x inside of this function, I am modifying this x, not that x. And so, like, maybe I could have called it a and b and something like that, but, you know, this is a senior level course at this point, and you're supposed to just understand the, the difference between globals, locals, and parameters. So, um, but coming back to it, eax is going to be my a, because that is my return value, right? I'm returning a right here. So anywhere where I have... Anywhere where I have an A, I can replace that. I could have done a global, but I'm, I want to keep it simple for you guys. And I want to replace this with EBX. So anytime I see X here, let me just, I thought the error would pop up a little more readily. I think I took care of all that. And then anytime I see Y, I'm going to replace this with ECX. And, <coughs> excuse me. And so you might go, why am I using ECX when I have a while loop? And the reason is because this is not one of those normal while loops, or you know, the loop instruction that we've been using for uh, the past few weeks. This is a little different when it comes down to the way we're going to loop this, because we don't know when we're going to finish this. Like a normal loop, hey, do something 10 times? Yeah, we can use the loop instruction. But it is not so easy when we don't know when this thing is truly going to end. So I'm going to do my global, or my... <laughs> Like manual global replace, and so let me just try this out. Let me make sure I did, let me make sure I put everything in the right place and run my program. And I go okay here. What is my x fifteen? What is my y six hundred? I should get nine thousand out of this, and I do. And so I am ready to kind of move on and use everything I've got going for me now. And so I'm going to now have both open so we can talk about how we can start porting this thing over from one place to the other. Okay, so now I've gone ahead and I've opened up two Visual Studios. And so now we have C++ over here and we have our blank empty assembly language over here. Let me just make sure I have everything going. And there's my empty blank window. So I am ready to kind of push forward. So first thing of note is my globals. I can go up here. These things are unsigned int. Uh, so I can use... Uh, I'm, I'm going to make X, and I'm going to call it a D word, because it's a double word, unsigned, and I'm going to, it's uninitialized, so there we go there. So I have an X and a Y, and down here I also have an R, so I'm going to do that as well. And my goal right now is, you know, there are simpler ways to do this, you know, when it comes to uh, writing the code and doing, you know, especially for a line of code like this, and you know, but I am going to stick with being the compiler here, the assembler, or I guess in this case the compiler, um, and I'm going to try to generate my assembly language as close to what the uh, compiler and the assembler would actually do. So I have my X, I have my Y, I have my R, and then I also have three things I'm going to print. So I'm going to have an X prompt. And these are all going to be bytes. Strings are always a, a series of bytes with a null terminating character. I'm going to steal this guy and drop it in. And so I have my X prompt. I have my Y prompt. So just, that's easy enough. And then I have my, the result is 
and then I can just call that result. Okay, and there we go. So those are the six uh, six things that we're going to need to get this to this program working. Of course, if I run my program at this moment, you will not even notice any difference. Okay, so now coming down to it, let's start the main. Let's get the main out of the way, and then we can go ahead and figure out what to do. So with for the function call. So I'm going to say move into the e, uh, edx register, the offset of x prompt, and then I'm going to call right string. So of course that is my print statement. And then, well, just, just again to make sure we did everything right, baby goose steps along the way here. So there is my print statement. And so now what I want next is the c in, so I can call read int immediately. And that EAX value that comes back from readint will hold the value that the user input. And so my CN is supposed to be into X, so I can go ahead and do a move EAX into X. And so now, just to show this off here, you go, okay, seven. Okay, so things, things seem to be working here. And we, now we can do the exact same thing for the Y. Just change things up slightly here. So now I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do the Y prompt. I get the right string. I read the int, and then EAX is going to go into Y. And so these, you know, these four lines of code have now been handled with eight lines of assembly language. And as you could imagine, each one of these lines of code here is obviously a few lines of code or more inside uh, the assembly language inside the Irvine library. Okay, so now coming back down here, this is where, we, uh, let's just do the final C out as well, and then we can do the function. So as you can imagine here, let me just borrow this, and then we'll start over. Let me just put a to do here. Okay, just so we have that, just so we can kind of remember where we're going here. So now I want to print out the result is, so I need that result string write the string, and then this is not a read int, this is a move into the EAX register, whatever stored in R, and then call write int. And then, uh, and then what I want after that is the call CRLF, or carriage return line feed, and then the cleanup on this is to call wait message. So that should take care of everything you see inside of main, but we didn't do anything. Let's just see what comes up. R theoretically should be, um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> need a drink. R theoretically might be zero, might be random numbers. Who knows what we're gonna do? You know, 500 times 67, and I get a zero. So even, even though in this case R is uninitialized, question mark, somehow it gets initialized to zero. Okay, so that handles the main function getting everything going, and now we have to talk about everything going on inside of here, inside the function. So as we develop this function for the first time, we kind of have to think out and kind of work with the main, since it's not, you know, none, neither part, neither the main or the function is, you know, developed at this point. So we're going to put this guy inside of here. I'm going to call it multiply. Just have to spell it right. There we go. Multiply proc, and I'll just put a ret here for the moment. You always need a ret inside of a function. And then multiply end p. So there we go. That is all we need to do for a skeleton for this thing to get started. And now we can actually call this down below here for this function. But now we also need documentation for what are the inputs and what are the outputs. And so maybe you already see it here. I am going to say the ebx value coming in is going to be the x. And it really doesn't much matter, but the ECX, you know, which is the X and which is the Y in this case, because multiplication is uh, whatever that term is. Is it distributive, not distributive, commutative, associative, whatever the term is, I can never remember. And so we have our two inputs, the EBX register and the ECX register, you can see here. And then the EAX register will hold the result of X times Y. So that's what we have decided, or I have decided on from previous. And it, you know, as long as you get the job done, as you'll see, it really doesn't matter how you end up using the register. Okay, so that's what we're working with here. And since we have that, now let's just, you know, again, we're we're doing this function here. 
this is what we're doing. And that's, you know, so that is what we're setting up. So I can move into the EBX register the X value, like we talked about from above. That's my global. I can move into the ECX register my Y, which is my you know, parameter parameter. I'm going to then call the function multiply. Oh, maybe I can, you know, maybe add. It's it's not case sensitive, but you know whatever the job is. And then when when this function returns, EAX will hold that value. And then just to be on the safe side, I will move whatever is in the EAX register into R, because that is my result. So now we really are truly done with the main when it comes to pretty much the whole thing. Set up parameter, set up parameter, call function, and do something with the return value, and everything else seems to be working. And again, we won't notice any difference here on this end. Oops, well, I guess we will. Uh, because whatever my second input is, that is what is in the EAX register. That is not modified by the function. And then when I come back, it will print out that value. Or maybe not. Interesting. But anyway, moving on. So let, let's just, okay, so the, the main should be completely done at this point. And um, now we're ready to go. Yeah, yeah. right now, whatever's in EAX will be moved to R. Whatever's R will be moved back to EAX. Yep, so everybody's, everybody's happy. Okay, so coming back here. So now, what do we have? We have our first statement, unsigned int EAX equals zero. That is a move zero into the EAX register. And now here's the tricky part, a while loop. A, if, you know, CIS 1400, our Python slash... Uh, programming logic course. Um, you know, when we do loops, we don't have to teach you anything new with flowcharts because the difference between a while loop, a for loop, and an if statement just comes out to how how many times do I repeat the body of the loop, and how many times do I try try again to you know to see if the conditional is true. If it's an if statement, we just try one time and we move on. But a while loop or a for loop is just in, in a lot of regards a repeated if statement. So the arrow inside of our flowcharts just moves to different places than it does in an if statement. So, but I still need you know, quite a bit to make this thing work. I need a label. I need two labels for this kind of while loop. And so the goal here is you know, I want this loop to repeat, but then you have to think the complete opposite, almost like a De Morgan's Law kind of thing, uh, that you have to go, well, yeah, in, in higher level languages, we write our code this way. Like, what do we have to do to, to continue the loop? But when we're writing code in assembly language, we have to reverse that logic and go, well, what do we have to do to end the loop? And so we're going to do a comparison here, and we're going to say we're going to compare ECX to zero. And remember, ECX is modified down below before we call in here. And we're going to say the opposite. What's the opposite of not equals? It is equals. And say if, if ECX is equal to zero, then go to done because the loop is completed. Otherwise, fall down and do stuff and then come down here and then jump back up to again to do the loop again. So there's... So there's two labels and three lines of code for every while loop you see this way. I, I'm hoping you get that because you need you need to loop, but then you need when you get out you need to kind of change change up and move outside the loop to continue my program. So that handles that situation there, and so now we're ready to move on to this guy, which is another comparison uh, in a way here. So this. That's a bitwise and operation there. That's not the that's not double double ampersand. And so what you know this is the the fast and efficient way to test even or oddness. Uh, we do teach in pretty much every language to use the modulus check. If x mod two equals zero, you have an even number. If x mod two equals one, you have an odd number. But this is you know the, this bitwise and operation is a one clock cycle version of that versus the many, many clock cycles that modulus takes, because modulus is division, and division is horribly slow in comparison. So in this case, I could use and, and I could say ECX comma 1, right? That's what, I'm, that's what this is saying. Take this 
ECX and AND it with 1. But AND is a destructive operation. The result will get put into the ECX register. And as you see here, we're going to need that you know, for later on here. We're going to be modifying things. And, we're, and nowhere in here does it say to actually change ECX. This is, this is just a temporary, and then it's getting set and tested to see if it's equal to 1. So the non-destructive AND is a test operation. OK, so now we have a non-destructive AND. And like, what is the, you know, so what is the point of a, an operation that is non-destructive? Well, what's really happening is all of the flags, the zero flag, the sign flag, and all, all the other flags are getting set but it's not modifying the register. So we're OK modifying flags. We're just not OK modifying registers. And actually, the comparison does, the CMP does the same thing. Uh, a subtraction is destructive. But a comparison is a non-destructive subtraction that modifies all of the flags. I mean, I just want, that's just the way it is. I think those are the only two uh, operations that have destructive and non-destructive uh, operations. And so now, this will set the flags. And I say, OK. And the same thing goes. What, this is what I have to do to do something. What do I have to do to not do it? And so I say, don't. I was going to say, don't do it. Then I'll use that here. And so the operation here will be jump if 0. Because this, is going, because this, this result, an AND operation, bitwise AND against 1, my, my result can only be one of two things. It can either be zero or it can be one. And the zero flag is an easy way to help differentiate the two. And so I can say now, if this thing is a zero, don't do any work. Because that's the opposite of it being equal to one, is it has to be equal to zero. So it won't do anything if that's the case. Otherwise, I will add into the EAX register whatever's in EBX. Right? So that's, that's how this thing all comes together. You know, do my non-destructive and see what I get. The, the zero flag will either be a zero or a one related to that. If it's a zero, then I don't want to do the body of this statement, so I come around. And if it is one, I'll fall through the, zero, the JZ, and I will start adding EBX into EAX. So the final two lines here are these guys, which are very simple shift operations. I know you've probably never seen that before in your life. Uh, and you're like, oh my, what, is, what does that have to do with C out and C in? And it doesn't. But what we're saying here is now I can say shift left uh, EBX by 1 and shift right ECX by 1. And so this is just a fancy and fast multiply by 2. And so we just, again, we don't have multiply just yet. So we're doing our best um, to do that. And if you want to think about it, you could technically add EBX, comma EBX to you know, add itself. So I guess that's the best way. Mul, mul 2 would be slowest. Add EBX, comma EBX would be a little faster. And then this is the fastest way to do things. And we can get away with it because we're, you know, we're using binary. And we can, use, we can multiply and divide by 2 very easily. So, so then coming down to it, when we you know, finish this thing up, and we finally come out the other end of this thing. We go keep looping and keep looping and keep looping. Then when we fall out and we finally hit this case where we jump around to done, the EAX register will hold the result, so I don't have to actually write any code for this. And so let's try this thing out. We're not done. There's one more step, but let's just make sure this thing works. So 15 times 600. Gets me 9,000. I did it correctly. You could test it out a few other times if you want. 14, 14 is 196, and so forth and so on. But we seem to be, we seem to be on a very good track here. Uh, you know, overflow, underflow, or all those things, are, negative numbers are not accounted for. Maybe they are. I'm going to try it just to see what happens if I put negative 15 times 6. Oh, it works. What if I put negative 15 times negative 15? I, oh, hey. We, this might, hey, we might get signed values for free. That's fine. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? So we would have to do some testing to make sure that that is the case. And I'm not doing that testing right now. I'm just doing my testing for the more simple cases. OK, so we can at this point say that our main is working properly. 
and our multiply function is working properly. And so the final step here is to in, is inside of our function is to say, okay, the EAX register has been modified and, and returned as we promised, but now what about all the other registers? Because, and you could say, yes, technically everything's working properly. But when I call this function now and I come back from this, my EBX register and my ECX register are being modified inside of there, so I can no longer trust your function because everything's been blown out. And if I was relying on that and I immediately did something with EBX and ECX anywhere down here, anywhere in my program after it, and I presume that it hasn't been modified, that I'm, you know, I am mistaken, and I'm going to have a logic error and a runtime error from it. So that, that's where the idea of the push and the pop comes from here. So now you kind of have to go, through, I always recommend doing this last because you want to make sure you have everything working properly before you go back and go, well, which registers did I modify? Because if you have a moving target here, by doing everything up front, you might modify something you know, later on while you're developing the function. And while you're doing that, you forget to put a push and a pop and you're right back where you were. You're in a case where uh, your function doesn't uh, fix everything up properly. So I just have EBX and ECX that is modified by this. You can go through, you know, you can go, okay, EAX, fine, we don't have to worry. ECX, yes, is, well, this isn't, a, this doesn't modify, this doesn't modify, this does, but we don't care, it's EAX, but these two modify EBX, ECX. So I do need a push EBX, I need a push ECX, and down below, right before the return, this is where you do the pop, and remember, you have to do it in the reverse order, because it is a stack. When I do my pushes and my pops, it's not a queue or anything like that, it is a stack. So if I, the top of the stack will hold the ECX value, so it should put, get put back into the ECX register, and then the next item will be the EBX register, which get, gets popped into there. And you won't notice any difference when it comes to running the function, but you would after you, after you call the function and you work out and you go, oh, EBX and ECX are perfectly good to go. So let's see, let's see if I can get this all on one page without it being up. Oh, I guess get out your glasses. There you go. I'm old, I can barely read that at this point. So, but there that handles everything there is to do with this this problem, this activity. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns, did I misspeak? Did I do anything wrong with this video? Uh, please let me know. Comment below or you can always email me at swordb at cod.edu. And so, um, we're, you know, so for the homework assignment for this week, you don't have to use any, uh, you don't have to use a function, you just gotta get the job done. But as we push forward into chapter seven and especially chapter eight, functions are gonna rear its head again. And we're going to learn how to do all of this the one correct way and play with the EBP and ESP registers and play with the call time stack and, and be computer gods when it comes to handling stacks and all sorts of cool stuff with, uh, with data. So thanks for sticking with it as always and uh, have a good one and I'll see you next time.